<laughs> 11 exactly. Um, welcome, class, to our research locum, class and guests. Uh, we are very fortunate to have a very busy person speak to us about her research. This is Dr. Michelle Cashmer. She's a professor here at the School of Information and also associate dean at the college level. Um, this is a dean for academic academic affairs and faculty development and advancement. So I am so I am I am quite properly a professor in the School of Information and Acad and Associate Dean for Academic Affairs and Faculty Development and Advancement for the College of Communication and Information at Florida State University, which is why I have neither a name tag nor a business card. That's right. <laughs> anyway, she's one of our brilliant scholars, uh, expert in qualitative research methods. That's true. Yeah. Give her a Thank you. So um, I'm going to do kind of the meta and then do the talk. So this is a framed talk for those of you uh, who've, who've read Ethan, who got to read Ethan Frome in high school. Uh, you know all about the frame. Okay. So yes, I'm originally a mechanical engineer. After I came into academia, I started doing qualitative research. For 15 or so years after I came to FSU, I did all team-based research, highly collaborative, lots of people, lots of PIs. Um, worked a lot with Dr. Lustria, who is an amazing quantitative researcher to work with if you're a qual person, because there's a lot of mutual respect, and we produced some really fantastic outputs, a couple of really highly cited JSON articles, just for example. Yay. Um, when I took on the associate dean role, in terms of thinking about my career, I realized, among other things, that I would not be a good research collaborator at that point. To be a good research collaborator, you have to really be able to be all in on a project. Even if you're all in on five other projects at the same time, still, you have to be able to be very responsive and able to be super respectful of everybody's timelines because you have people whose master's degrees, doctoral degrees, publishable papers, tenure, promotion, are depending on you to pull your weight in terms of producing that output. Now is not the time for me to try to be a good collaborator. I was a good collaborator for a long time. Now, I hope I was anyway. Now is, now, <laughs> now is not that time. So um, I fortunately uh, have a life, almost lifelong interest in golden age detective fiction. Uh, like many kids, I was a kid who started reading Agatha Christie novels when I was in seventh grade because seventh grade was so, unbelievably freaking boring um, that the teachers and I kind of established a detente where I would sit there with an Agatha Christie book under my desk all day long reading and that meant I wasn't asking them any questions and they would leave me alone as long as I was still getting my A's in their classes which okay so and that's how I read the entire Agatha Christie corpus which is quite large during one school year um, because that was the teacher's way of allowing me to keep myself out of their hair. Mm -hmm. And so when I was looking for a research agenda that I could pursue where there weren't going to be other people depending on me to come to meetings and do my half of the data analysis and my half of the lit review and ah, by Friday, and it's Friday, grah, um, I uh, made friends on Twitter with a researcher at the University of Exeter who was doing his dissertation as a queer reading of Agatha Christie's pre-war novels. And I, you know, I did one of those things that you can only do over social media where I was like, hi, oh my god, it's me, I'm here. And he was just like, okay, there's a crazy lady in Tallahassee, Florida, who has decided to kind of insert herself into my mentions. Well, yeah, and I did so, and then he had a conference, and I showed up at his conference, so it's all these doctoral students from the UK and me. And that, they were really excited by that. He was able to call his conference interdisciplinary and uh, international, simply by virtue of my showing up. And so I've been pursuing this research agenda since then. I've done a number of papers about a variety of different topics associated with Golden Age detective fiction. I started out working primarily with Agatha Christie. I've also done some work, uh, Agatha Christie Qua, the Murder, She Wrote television series. Um, uh, watch that space, by the way, because I got a very exciting Facebook message from a friend of mine at the University of Southampton this week. Um, hey. And um, I've also done some work looking at Agatha Christie in comparison with American authors, and particularly looking at Rex Stout, although I'm starting to expand into some other, other 
un underlooked at areas, including Elizabeth Daly and maybe a little bit of SS Van Dyne. So that's where we come today. I am giving this paper in a month in Chester, England, assuming. Right. <laughs> okay. Um, and so the, the paper, so I, I scheduled myself for this colloquium. Why? Because this would force me to make sure I at least had a PowerPoint and maybe a couple of vaguely coherent thoughts before I got on the plane to go to Chester, because I sleep on planes. I can't work on planes. Some people can work on planes. I can't work on planes, because the second they rev the engines up, I fall into a deep sleep. I miss the security briefing. I miss the food. I'm one of those people we land, and I'm like, are we still in Atlanta? I'm like, this is not Atlanta. So I had to be, I had to force myself to do something. So I agreed to do this, which was really good, because it meant this week I could, oh my gosh, because it's talk, right? Um, and so what you see here is what that will be, which means some of it I'll have to do a little bit of extra explanation because this is designed for a different audience. It's not designed for you. This audience is designed for people who can close down a pub doing an Agatha Christie trivia quiz because nobody gets far enough ahead to actually win. Okay, this is what happened at the last conference I went to. Um, it was pretty awesome. Okay, so I said, you guys are doing something about golden age. Why don't I talk about the documentation movement and information science? And they're all like, we have no idea what that is, but you go right ahead. I'm like, sure. So this is what you're going to get today, if I can figure out how to make the slides go. Yeah, there we go. All right. The golden age of crime fiction is roughly defined as puzzle-based, mystery, fiction, OK? Not true crime, not romance, not sci-fi, puzzle-based, okay, produced between the First and Second World Wars. I, on the other hand, always wanting to be the contrarian, argue that the Golden Age actually ended shortly after World War II, when people were forced to grapple with the reality of a permanently changed world. So what we see in the, now this is Anglo-American, Canadian, largely Commonwealth puzzle fiction. Okay, Chinese murder mystery fiction predates this by several hundred years, right? And that's another really cool, interesting research agenda, and there are other spaces in the world where, where there are other threads to follow that are really, really cool in South America, but I, you know, there's only one me. <sighs> okay, and this is what I've got right now. Um, really, when we read the during World War II era fiction, there's still a sense of things are going to get back to normal. This war is going to end, but it's temporary, and things are going to get back to normal. And it's only really once you start getting into sort of 1949, 1950 through 1952, where people start to go, oh, no, there is, there is no back to normal. This is our new thing that we refuse to call normal because we hate it so much, right? And, and I'll talk about that in a little minute. So, um, so my argument is that as long as people are looking back and thinking that things are going to come back to normal, we start to see the same threads in the fiction, and they really don't start to change out. There's a lag. So Golden Age crime fiction is also characterized by being written by a member of the detection club. What that means is that it's UK only. And in fact, a lot of times when you see people write, writing or talking about Nero Wolf, S.S. Van Dyne, other American authors who were operating in that time, they will call it Golden Age type, Golden Age like fiction because it wasn't written in the UK by a member of the detection club. And admittedly, there were other kind of threads in the literature going on in the US as well during this time. So there, this is where we start to see the hard boiled stuff. Those guys, those guys out in California, as I like to call them. So this is Raymond Chandler and Dashiell Hammett, who really kind of rejected this whole very tidy puzzle based type of crime in order to, you know, when they tried to speak of Raymond Chandler, when they tried to do the movie of the big sleep, and Billy Wilder, they were working on the script, and they called Raymond Chandler. They were like, we can't follow the plot. He's like, yeah, I can't either. <laughs> True story. Right? And they also followed Playfair rules that were set out by Knox's Decalogue, which were the rules set out for the UK Detection Club, S.S. Van Dyne's 20 Rules for Writing Detective Stories, or Raymond Chandler's 10 Commandments for Writing Detective Novels. And Raymond Chandler's, I, I said, but not really, because those were actually just written. They're really just purely snark against Agatha Christie. He just kind of had, he didn't like women. I mean, he had all kind of access to grind, so... You know, we'll just leave him over there in California. And lovely books. I mean, they're, they're, they're exciting reads for what they are, but what they are is not this. And so we've got all that going on. And at the same time, we've got this European-American documentation movement comes squarely from our field. Right? So we've got 
the European documentation movement, um, which has kind of two waves. And the first wave is epitomized by the establishment of the IIB in Belgium by Otle and La Fontaine. And so the idea there, right, bibliography, bibliography. Well, we think of bibliography as a list of citations at the end of something that we're reading, but when we're thinking about bibliography at this time, we have traditions of things like descriptive bibliography. I'm going to make an exhaustive, complete list of everything by this person or about this topic with substantial annotations, not just about the content, but really about the physical structure of the thing that I'm talking about. Right? And the idea is that you can describe an item by looking inward, and you can make a list by thinking about how that item relates to other items. I can do that in, to use an old indexing term, a pre-coordinated way, as I'm the person making the list, and I'm going to tell you this is a bibliography about you know, resources for kids about AIDS, um, to reference one of my colleagues out there display case, right? Or they can be what I would may even call, she's not in the display case, Kathy, post-coordinated in the sense that a reader comes and says, I need you to give me everything that you can produce about um, the AIDS crisis during the 1980s and early 1990s, right? And then you sort of craft a list based on having done really good descriptions of the items that you've got. All right. So Otley and LaFontaine are men. And the reason that becomes important is that the second wave is marked by the work of uh, Brier, Suzanne Brier, who is not a man, and the renaming of the IIB to the IID in 1931. And, of course, this becomes integral to the war science of World War II. World War II was fought very differently from previous wars, and this whole idea that you can draw on science to help you win a war, it came up a little bit in World War I, right? Like, oh, mustard gas, um, um, which was exciting and terrible, right? But we see it substantially increased in World War II. And in the United States, we see so, sort of, no, yes, two related movements, John Cotton Dana and the Special Libraries Association. All right, so, and we still have this battle today. People talk about libraries, they talk and they think about public libraries. I get increasingly frustrated by this. I used to work in a special library myself. I worked in a library at Ford Motor Company. It was A, it was called the Technical Information Service. B, we didn't have to worry about things like internet filtering for our E-rate because we didn't have children in our library what they'd be doing there, right? I didn't have to worry about genre fiction. We didn't have genre fiction. That wasn't what we were there for. What we were there for was to do things like find relevant patents for engineers who were trying to create new products. So we had to do things like obscure our patent searches. So for every patent search we ran against a patent database, we would have to run a certain number of fake searches about plausible topics that were not things that the company was actually doing, right? So very different from trying to figure out how to tattle tape all of your Purell bottles. For those of you following what's going on in public libraries right now, this is an actual, an actual resource problem. Okay? And then Watson Davis and the American Documentation Institute, which is now called... Anybody other than Kathy? <laughs> Go ahead. The Association of Information Science and Technology. Yeah, that's now ACES. <laughs> all right. <laughs> there it was. Yeah, and they still actually give the Watson Davis Award. Last I checked. Um, okay, so we've got so we've got this all going on. A characteristic of the documentation movement is this idea: the transition from viewing information as an organic mass that flowed largely via interpersonal channels, or was reified in bound volumes and jealously guarded, stored. Right. So this is name of the rose thing, right? To something that could be parceled into vessels other than books, labeled, organized, retrieved, and applied algorithmically to solve scientific problems. So, right, this is, so you're starting to see scientific management, Taylorism kind of pop in here, right? Things are commodities to be moved around in a space. And, um, and we're talking about, you know, when I say vessels other than books, articles, patents, and there was a reason I mentioned those a minute ago, um, right, reports, but also things we don't necessarily think of as documents, such as chemical structures. So chemical abstracts was actually one of the very earliest databases that we had for retrieving little parcels of information, and it was partly because not only were there scientific articles by chemists, but there were also information about chemical structures, and you needed to be able to retrieve not just on the words, but on the structure itself. So it's a whole different kind of thinking about information. So information had to be recorded, organized, and retrieved, and the purpose of science was preeminent. And in the post-war, information turmoil echoes societal turmoil. And as a result, the efforts to control it increase. So we go from this kind of big, wavy, loosey-goosey, I'm going to write beautiful, illuminated manuscripts, which is not loosey-goosey at all, um, into I'm going to parcel things out into these little tiny containers, which I can then manipulate and hopefully make a profit from. Okay. So, in the 
this context, what did I decide to do? I decided to read fiction because, you know. Um, so I looked at uh, the Rex Stout novellas that are, that are captured in Not Quite Dead Enough, which explicitly invoked the war. Those were serialized in 1942 and 1944 before they were published, so they really are in the war of the war. And Black Orchids, which don't. Those were serialized in 41 and 42. So Rex Stout, who maintained a very, very rigorous writing schedule, exceedingly rigorous um, writing schedule, would have written those before America joined the war. So the war was going on. It was bubbling out there in the world, but we weren't really involved yet in the United States. Okay, and I looked at the Agatha Christie novels, The Body in the Library in 1942, which, um, and Five Little Pigs, um, also 1942. The UK was squarely at war, and Agatha specifically decided not to address the war in her work because, I mean, it was too stressful, basically. So she was trying to offer an escape or a release. Um, and so those were the pieces I decided to look at. But let's back out a little bit again. Because for me to argue that these things are of the documentation movement and of the golden age, you know, maybe everything that happened here, it, it, that, that that's true of everything. So it's not interesting that it's true of these four works. All right, so to what extent is golden age detective fiction all intrinsically documentalist? I would say actually that it all is um, for some reasons that I'll go over in a minute. And to what extent are the Rex Stout Nero Wolf stories intrinsically documentalist? I would actually argue that they all are. Again, for reasons that I'll talk about. So, the Golden Age rules are intrinsically documentalist. So you can look them up yourselves. These are Knox's rules, Van Dyne's rules, uh, Chandler's rules for writing detective fiction. Um, they're generally ori around to, oriented around the concept of playfair. The idea is that you have to play fair with the reader. And this is why coming completely embedded myself in a tradition of Playfair detective fiction, why when someone in this room who won't be named forced me to read an instance of the finger post, I will be mad until I die about an instance of the finger post, which let's just say it's beautifully written. It doesn't play fair. Doesn't play fair. Oh, I'm, oh, I'm still just so fierce because it's really long. I mean, these are hours and hours of my life I'm never going to get back, right? The idea is, ahem, Ian cares, there's no supernatural mechanism at play here, for those of you following along at home. So no sweet writing, mind reading, Ouija boards, spiritualistic seances, or crystal gazing, right? That there are no accidents, right? That realism is paramount, that the method of murder must be rational and scientific, and the solution must be based on logical deductions. Now, one of the fun things about Agatha Christie, if you know her work well, and how it operates within the realm of all Golden Age detective fiction, in fact, all subsequent detective fiction, is that pretty much anything you think of as being a cliche or a trope of detective fiction, she invented clean out of her own head, right? So, Everybody did it, nobody did it, the narrator did it, the butler did it, the police officer did it, right? And these are all things that like now we just think of as being these kind of typical tricks that authors play on us. In pretty much every one of those cases, Agatha Christie did it first. And in a lot of those cases, I would argue, because I'm exceedingly biased, as she also did it best, that everything that has come out in the last hundred years has basically just been a pale imitation of that. Um, um, but, she played very, very explicitly with every single one of these rules because she was one of those people, and so I think this is why we like to study her today, who you would give her a rule and she was like, oh, let me see what I can do to flout that. Um, and it made her kind of an interesting, um, fun writer to read as a result. Right? But the Rex Stout Nero Wolf stories are, I would argue, intrinsically documentalist too. Nero Wolf's life his whole life is oriented around aesthetic arts that are also sciences, gastronomy, orchid growing, and detection. So, right, he, he, he's into cooking food. Actually, he's not into cooking food. He's into designing and then eating food that somebody else cooks. And he's into planning the production of orchids that somebody else actually has to grow. <laughs> and he's into engaging in genius detection by sitting in his house and having somebody else do the footwork, right? And very much like Miss Marple uh, in the Agatha Christie novels, and I'm not, well, I, I'm talking a little bit about Marple later. Genius is, we think of genius now, 
in very much in line with the whole documentation, the whole scientific management as being a thing that you can quantify, right? You measure it, it's on a, there's a beautiful little bell curve, genius is out here, right? But genius, when Ms. Marple is characterized as genius, when Nero Wolf is characterized as genius in these works, it's really meant as still kind of an unknowable, ununderstandable quantity. It's not just being smarter, there's something sort of intrinsically different and almost, dare I say, supernatural about genius and the way it's manifested here. And uh, Goodwin, Archie Goodwin, who is Nero Wolf's sidekick, uh, was a huge departure in terms of sidekicks. Up to this point, sidekicks had been kind of dumb, right? That was their stock in trade. They weren't as smart as the major detective. Well, Archie Goodwin is constantly told by Nero Wolf to use his um, intelligence guided by experience out in the world. He's given a huge amount of autonomy and control over how he interacts with clues, with people, and with the environment around him. And Goodwin is also, uh, someone like Brie's antelope, is himself a document. So huge amounts of stress is placed on the fact that he can always create a verbatim transcript from memory of any conversation that he's had. He himself manifests the world out there, this wild, uncontrollable, crazy world that Nero Wolf can't cope with. Archie Goodwin turns it into documents for Wolf to be able to engage his genius on. And he is also a proficient typist and has his own shorthand system, right? And you're suddenly like, wait, he's a shorthand typist. I thought you said he was a man. Yes. And guess what? The uh, chef in this house, also a man. The person who grows the, the beautiful, pretty, happy pink flowers, also a man. So there's some kind of interesting gender play uh, that goes on here. He made, uh, Rex out, wrote Nero Wolf as an intrinsically misogynistic person, which is why you've got these men here. But going back to the documentation movement, right? Old joke, I'm sure you all know this. Information science is what? Librarianship practiced by men. <laughs> right? So you have the same kind of thing going on here, right? Where, you know, women do libraries, but men do documentation. And so you've got the same kind of gender play here. Women do flowers, women cook food, except not in your know, house, they don't. All right, so the core of my analytic argument. You're like, lady, you're more than halfway through your time and you're on slide nine. How is this possible? How have we just gotten here? Yeah, well, going back to the specific text I read, I explore the ways that information is and is not handled within the text itself, in my close reading, um, in traditional organic ways and ways that are marked by those crisp edges and systematic retrieval of the documentation movement. So for each of the things that I looked at, I kind of identified a theme. And the theme for black orchids, so this is one of the Rex Stout's Nero Wolf books, is pastoral nostalgia juxtaposed with violence, right? So we've got this looking back to the pastoral nostalgia associated with the prior to documentation way that we deal with information. Um, they've got a woodland glade, not a woodland lab. Sorry about that. Um, Right, so you've got a flower show. What could be more delightful and bucolic than a flower show? And everybody's there with their flowers. And these people explicitly, in fact, Rucker and Dill, which is one of the companies that's showing flowers, they make this even more pastoral and fake than that. They build a whole little glade and they have actors pretending to be enjoying this where they do the same thing every day at exactly the same time. Well, any of, the, any of you who read detective fiction have already gone, oh no, that's a really bad idea. Yes, of course it is, because you've got these two people doing exactly the same actions over the course of eight hours of the day for the entire run of the flower show. So needless to say, terrible things happen. But normally, it's this incredibly kind of happy, nostalgic past until we engage in battle, xenophobia, and incredibly disgusting violence, which is all the more painful in juxtaposition to this kind of nostalgia. So the war intrudes, right? Um, getting Nero Wolf through and up to the fourth floor was like a destroyer making a way through a minefield for a battleship. That's really one of the only call outs to the actual war in this particular piece. Um, there's an intentionally anti-Japanese racist plant fungus where I left the name out because that's the practice of this conference is not to include that um, in the text that you're, that you're showing in public. Um, a disease fatal to broadleaf evergreens thought to be a fungus. And it's given, like I said, a very explicitly racist Japanese name within the context of the book. And a viscerally disgusting description of a, of a gunshot, which is maybe, I mean, this is pretty tame mystery fiction that I read. I don't tend to read a lot of gore. And this is actually one of the most absolutely disgusting things that I've ever read. I remember the first time I read this when I was in my early 20s and I was like, that's nasty. All right. All right. So this juxtaposition between looking back toward 
we're all in a world where everything is wonderful and everything's kind of interpersonal and warm and delightful uh, compared to this whole, we're going to use science in order to try to kill people with fungus and battleships and, right, and this very forensic view of a gunshot wound, right? <clears throat> we continue to see this idea of taking things and packaging them. So this fungus disease is inflicted on a plant grower who's, who's plants had not been afflicted by it before, by being packaged into a container of peat mulch for transport. So we see this packaging and, and moving things around. The culprit is ostensibly outed by a specific piece of documentation, a, a garage receipt for where they stopped to have their car serviced at a place where they weren't supposed to be. Right? And the villain attempts to escape by creating a poison gas chamber. Okay, 1941, right? So. Rex Scout was a member of the War Writers Board in the United States. He was one of, one of the early people who was really trying to raise the alarm in the United States about the genocide that was occurring in Central and Eastern Europe at the time. And this is one of the ways that he tried to get that out in front of the public because people were not listening. Right? And, uh, and dies himself of poison gas in a sealed room. So in this case, the, he gets their comeuppance fairly early on. Right? So let's go from Rex Stout back to Agatha Christie. We're going to go back and forth a little bit. So, the body in the library. Right? The body in the library, right? There was this whole thing about, oh, all these people in these country house British novels where the body's already found, always found in the library. Agatha Christie's like, I never put a body in the library. Why would you do that? That's stupid. So she was like, well, I'm going to figure out how to put a body in the library. If, that, if people are going to think that that's a trope, I'm just going to go ahead and do it and see how I can play with it. So it's this, it's this very intentionally self-conscious British country house setting with the body in the library where we just encounter an extremely matter-of-fact use of official documents. Okay, so everything is going in a nice, tidy way here. We have wills where, where people's intentions about how they're going to deal with their family, those interpersonal relationships, get reified into a very specific official document that has a legal role in the world. And the same thing with marriage certificates. And in fact, the entire mystery is propagated and subsequently solved almost exclusively through these official documents. But there are truly horrific a actions. A, a lot of people really ignore this aspect of the body in the library. A child is murdered in this one, and a child is murdered in this one not because of anything they did at all. They are literally incidental to the purpose of the murderer in this case. And Agatha Christie doesn't shy away from child victims or child perpetrators. Oh, that's right, that's another one she invented. Um, but in this case, it's really, it's kind of a throwaway, and it's excruciatingly painful. Um, there's a, there are explicit calls out to the Gothic and, uh, and to the xenophobic, but of course, as always with Agatha with a twist, who never felt reluctant at all to be explicitly xenophobic when she wasn't playing with the text, but in this case, she was. She has a supporting character who's not British, but is attractive and competent, and then a supporting character who is entirely British and is unattractive and incompetent. So there's all kinds of mucks around there with societal norms, right, that all kind of plays around this firm thread of official documents. Speaking of official documents, how do you get those official documents out in the world? Right? Well, one way to do that is by having a communication infrastructure. So Rex Dell, in Not Quite Dead Enough, decides to pull out communication and transportation technology infrastructures, um, and he starts the thing with Archie Goodwin in a plane. Archie Goodwin doesn't belong in an airplane. It doesn't make any sense. I mean, you, you read the thing, you're like, ah, what's Archie Goodwin doing in an airplane? Right? But he's a military officer at this point, and he's in an airplane, and he's coming back to New York from Washington, D.C., and in this one, suddenly people start sending telegrams. And up until this point in the, in the Nero Wolf books, nobody sends telegrams. They walk around, they maybe send mail, they read the newspaper, they make a lot of phone calls, but suddenly we have telegrams because it's wartime and we're going to be using this technology. And we also, hilariously enough, have the, infra the communication infrastructure of carrier pigeons, um, which again, doesn't really show up anywhere here, but in the, in the scope of World War II is actually a very relevant piece of communication technology. But highly so the whole novel itself, then, the actual plot is highly social. And the key information exchange about the murder, the way the whole thing actually gets solved, is both completely interpersonal, relying on absolutely none of these technologies whatsoever, and is also accidental. And it makes me a little twitchy to read it. That's okay. Um, and this novella is also characterized, as I say here, by intergenerational, highly personal family conflict. So this is one where we have young adults and very old adults and middle-aged people, which again, for Rex Stout, is a little bit unusual. So we have this kind of callback to 
the family and thinking about family relationships and how people interact with one another and how they interact with their communication environment around them, again, with this core of telegrams carrier pigeons and Archie wandering around in his uniform fighting with Lily Rowan. And finally, the fourth one is Five Little Pigs. And Five Little Pigs is all about the narrative structure. Now, Five Little Pigs is actually my very favorite Agatha Christie novel. Um, most people don't, don't admit to having a favorite. I have a favorite, and it's Five Little Pigs, um, if I absolutely had to pick. And Five Little Pigs is one of her murder in retrospect books. Now, she actually wrote a book called Murder in Retrospect. This is, okay, it's kind of beside the point. <laughs> So it's one of her, you know, somebody comes to Poirot and asks him to solve a mystery that happened 16 years ago, right? And in doing so, um, you can look at it as really a pastoral nostalgic, right? We're in the era of war, and she, Agatha Christie actually writes something where we're going back 16 years, so we don't have to deal with any of that, right? So she uses that as a technique to place us in a space where a whole bunch of people are coming in and out of a country house and everybody knows everybody and they all grew up together and they all have these deep interpersonal connections and it's all good and sure they're a little bit of problem because this person was in love with this other person and she jilted him for this other person and she was in, in his room at night oh my god it's a scandal uh right <clears throat> but i would argue that it's actually the most documentalist of the texts that i analyzed a the way this document the way this novel is structured is that poirot goes and he talks to five different people and he asks each one of them not to tell him a story, but to write down a story. They need to encapsulate, they need to record, they need to organize their narrative in a specific way and give him a document. This is really unusual because this is not normally how he operates. Right? And so these oral stories are written, written down on paper into chronological narratives. Also, one of the main characters is a chemist, one is an anthropologist and one is a feminist. So we don't have a lot of main characters in this book. This is actually really odd to, to start to have these atypical, you know, country people in this country house who are out hunting and shooting and fishing, and one of them's an artist, and one's a chemist, one's an anthropologist, and one is a feminist. And the whole novel involves encapsulations and categorizations, both of memory and of substances. So we're constantly taking liquids in this particular one and putting them into different containers so that we can move them around in the world and then uncontainer them, which is both documentalist and certainly war, chemical warfare um, related as well. So war is murder, right? So in the same way that you can say the documentation movement kind of emerged from, because remember World War II was the only war, <laughs> Right? The documentation movement sort of got tangled up in this whole idea that we have to be able to deploy scientific information for weapons of war. In the same way, murder mysteries started to play out, calling on the documentation movement. And so clearly, war is murder, which we knew anyway. So murder mysteries in particular always include violent violence, so they always call out to themes that resonate with war. Detective mysteries always hinge on clues, which going back to Poe and certainly to Austin Freeman and Conan Doyle are both scientific and bounded. Although, bless his heart, my 15-year-old is trying to read Hound of the Baskervilles right now, and we were just sitting down trying to slog, I, uh, trying to slog through Arthur Conan Doyle's prose makes me want to tear large chunks of my hair out. It's just, it's a thing. Um, now luckily I was reading it on the Kindle, so I was able to do a lot of this, but still it was excruciatingly painful. But the social structures in which these are embedded persist from pre-war to the during war. And the nostalgia and the interpersonal interactions are all these kind of intergenerational, pastoral, backward looking. And so when we look at post-war detective fiction, um, we find much more focus on the disruption of the social fabric. And then that's where I would take this moving along then to thinking about how post-war breaks and now we're back to the meta because now we are done. All right. <laughs> A lot of fun with this one. Obviously, I had fun with the writing. I had fun with the reading. I had fun with thinking of thinking through um, old friends like Ale and Lafontaine and Brie and Watson Davis and John Cotton Dana and how they were roaming around the world in the same time as some other old friends um, and and what that meant about the fiction that I enjoyed so much. So, do you have any questions? I'm like, nope, is she going to stop now? <laughs> Would you mind telling me what puzzle mystery is? 
Sure. So the the idea of calling it a puzzle mystery is that there are pieces, clues, characters, occurrences that if they are properly arranged into a sensical order will reveal the solution of the mystery. Right? So in order for that to work it means that you have to have all the pieces, there can't be anything missing, and that's part of Playfair. And the pieces have to be, they have to relate to each other, so it can't be just these kind of random incoherent things, right? And there has to be some kind of pattern. Does that help? It does. Okay. <laughs> Do you think there are mystery writers now that have built on this? I'm a big Ruth Rendell reader. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm seeing little pieces of this there. She plays around with a few different approaches. So I'm just wondering if you think this really kind of picked up this tradition and continued with it. I'm assuming Paul is snickering back there because he knows that I'm about to say that I don't read anything that was written after 1960. Um, so I don't read a lot of current mystery fiction, actually. Um, what I find is that I tend to get incredibly frustrated because my reaction is always, oh, Agatha did this better in blah, 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 or Dorothy did this better in blah, 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 or whatever. And it's not a good thing. You know, I need to be more open-minded into, <laughs> into appreciating what people are bringing to the table in terms of modern, right? Um, one of the interesting things, too, is that you know, like technology causes us all kinds of problems. There are so many mysteries that were written now that you don't wouldn't make any sense with DNA testing. Yes. Right? <laughs> or cell phones. <laughs> <laughs> right? So there's, you know, so it's always, you know, so I, I, I get kind of involved in ones that, and so for example, then things, occasionally something will come out and it will have so much buzz that I'll be like, okay, all right. So, what was that one? Magpie Murders? Horowitz. Horowitz's Magpie Murders, right? Which, A, another framed story, yay, right? So it's a framed story, and so the inside story, the one that's right, is has all of these really super overt Agatha Christie references, like intentionally so, right? Like the thing is designed as a golden age homage. And so you could read the inside story, um, kind of fun, kind of like watching Knives Out where you can just sit there and start yelling out titles, which is what I did in the theater when we saw Knives Out until my kid was like, would you shut up? <laughs> <laughs> um, but it was really fun, except that the framed story on the outside is ripped from the plot of the pilot of Murder, She Wrote. <laughs> <laughs> so there's supposed to be like a twist at the end, and I'm reading it, and I'm like, what? I know this story. Like, I really know this story really, really, really well. Remember I said I spent 18 weeks uh, in bed when I was pregnant with my second child? Well, all I did during that entire time, I couldn't do anything because any stress was sending me into labor, and it was really important that I didn't go into labor. So all I did that entire time was watch Murder, She Wrote DVDs nonstop for 18 <laughs> weeks. I slept, looked out the window, and watched Murder, She Wrote. Like, literally, that's it. And I think my kid still has kind of a really kind of, like, pleasant, happy reaction if he hears Angela Lansbury's voice, and he's not sure why. But anyway, Marcia, that's my, that's my thing, is I don't read enough modern mystery fiction, because when I read it, I tend to get frustrated. Um, and that's a character flaw on my part. Not what about modern mystery writers who try to evoke this time period in their mysteries? <laughs> <laughs> I, I have a couple in mind. And the reason why I say this is because they're incredibly popular. Oh, yeah. So, yeah. You know. But I also tried to read The Da Vinci Code, and you can imagine how well that went. I mean, you know. Cause, yeah, I yeah. think Louise Penny is actually a good example of a modern mystery writer okay. who does uh, a lot of what Agatha Christie does. And she also uses these tropes like the, the village where the novels take place in is within driving distance from Montreal, but it's hard to find it. And when you get there, the cell phones don't work. Ah, right? uh, okay. No cell yeah. Coverage. And so yeah. there's certain things that she can do, but then she can play with that against being, you know, the, the, the main character is the chief inspector in Montreal. So, uh, you know, she can play back and forth between this highly technical and then this totally pastoral environment. Cool. 
Yeah, and I'm always willing to take recommendations. For things I think that the whole Tarot Noir sort of subgenre really honors this. And it's sure. Not, yeah. Do you think do you think that perhaps like the, that when you compare the two like the, the times that you've read like modern and novel, do you think that maybe some of the craftsmanship is not as intricate as it used to be? Do you, have you had that experience? Um, I think it's the in some ways it's the opposite, right? Although there's right there's Dorothy L. Sayers who wrote about as intricate a book as you could possibly write in terms of plot, in terms of characterization, but also just in terms of her use of language right. and her use of whatever, right? I can remember the first time I tried to read Murder Must Advertise when I was like maybe 15 years old, and there's a 30-page sequence in there of a cricket game. And if you don't know anything about cricket, which of course <laughs> I didn't, it. it, it's just, it's and it's really, it's incredibly detailed, but it's also, it's this kind of psychological thing, and it's very... It's very intricate. But on the other hand, Agatha Christie, right? One of the things about Agatha Christie is that if, you, if you're looking for prose that is clear as light, clean as bone, firm as stone, two words are never better than one, you're not going to find much better than Agatha Christie because she's so parsimonious. But that's what kind of what I mean because the craftsmanship, like to yeah. make it so direct and yeah. simple and, 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 yet, and the imagery to come to you so quickly requires incredible It does, especially because in almost all of her books, she gives you the answer, the actual answer. She actually tells you explicitly who the murderer is within the first 10 pages. And you still don't know who it is right. until you so get to the so end. So that's the intricacy, Which, right? Yeah, exactly. And it, and it presents, yeah, but, and it presents as very clean. And I, yeah, so then I read something like Ian Paris, The Instance of the Finger Post, which is lovely, <laughs> but oh, God. <laughs> 600 pages goes on and on and on and on and then it has a supernatural ending and then and then I get frustrated. Um, yeah, you might as well watch a Scooby-Doo episode. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes! Paul! In my defense, I didn't know that she wanted the daily author to have to play fair, right? Because, yeah, I otherwise... This was a long time ago. <laughs> it was a long time ago. I have a question, but I only have... Half of a question, so I'm hoping you can write the other half and then answer it. Right, so, Otley yeah. and, and La Fontaine, right? One of their stated goals of the Institute was to prevent war, was to preserve peace. You know, the, the whole idea. Yeah, well, was, Einstein didn't mean to accidentally well, it, create the Institute. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> their whole idea was that if you had access to scientific information, that would stop wars war. from coming out. And of course, that turned out to be probably not only not true, but explicitly false, right? Well, so, and, yeah. And in fact, so I, I would argue that the mystery writers, all you. of them, are very particularly arguing against that stance because their whole argument all the time is the more science you give people access to, the more likely they are to figure out how to use it to murder the people closest to them. Which is why I'm not allowed to grow castor bean plants for those who are following along at home. <laughs> so many rules in my house. No castor bean plants, no taser. Um, <laughs> it's exhausting, really. Does that make sense? Yeah, no, and that's, and that fits, that's I, the question I was trying to figure out. Right? And in fact, and I, and I think there are people who would also even put a gendered spin on it, right? Because you, you can also, when you look at the gender, right, when you look at the stuff that was being written by Anthony Barclay and John Dixon Carr and whatever, right, they still have that very adorable kind of male idealism. Right, it it took it, it took Agatha right, it really took Agatha Christie to come in and be like, no, I'm gonna have the granddaughter do it. You know what I mean? Like to really kind of plumb the depths of of how how intrinsically evil could be. And so for her, that was what that was always one of her core concepts as well is that there there is such a thing as just intrinsic evil, intrinsic unredeemable evil that can't be fixed and always needs to be eradicated. It's not super. Uh huh. And it's not supernatural. It's just because you're a bad person. Yes. Yep. It's just because you're a bad, bad person. <laughs> Which, you know, does that so, answer your question? Yeah. So Otley and, uh, and La Fontaine are naive, you know, idealists, right? And Agatha Christie is I a mean, realist. Uh, and again, I mean, that's, a, that's a, I think that's an over. A, yeah, that's an overly simple way of putting it. Obviously, which I'm kind of intentionally doing in, in contraposition to you as a French man. Right, because right. I think they were funny. They were right. They were like, wait. Well, yeah. yeah, and they were also a little, wrote, right? but they were also a little earlier, yeah. right? So I think you, I think you hadn't really seen yet, 
you know, I mean, so much of what happened during World War I when people really were able to take science, and even really actually going back, well, I mean, even going back to this, the civil wars that happened, right, and then thinking about the, the Spanish-American War, right, and then thinking about World War I and the, ex the increasing ways that people took science. Now, you could argue that, that they should have looked back all the way to the history that you study and been like, no, actually, sorry, he's ancient Roman historiographer back there, um, that it has always been the case that as soon as we have a scientific advancement, we take it and weaponize it, right? You know, 2001 is Space Odyssey, right? I mean, the Clark and, 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 and Kubrick and that whole thing, right? Um, so you could say that, yeah, I mean, no, they, they don't even really get the benefit of the doubt of, of being of their time because they should have known. They should have been able to look back and say, no, anytime you make more information available to people about the technology or the science at their disposal, the more likely they are to weaponize it. I don't know. It's kind of bleak, isn't it? <laughs> it, is, it is bleak. And you, you wonder, right? Like, what, what, you know, I guess I just study research topics that are bleak. Can I, can I ask a side question? Um, related to the weakness. Okay. What's your feeling on a lot of the newer movies and television movies related to murder mysteries? Right. So I think there are some things that have worked really well. Um, the the um, Lucy Liu Sherlock, for example, where that was a television series where she played Watson, right? Um, I thought was lovely. Um, Johnny Lee Miller as Sherlock, and they and they moved it temporally, and they they moved it geographically, and they moved it with gender, and they moved it with race and ethnicity, and I thought it worked really well. Um, I watched every one, actually. Um, you know, and then there's things like John Malkovich's ABC Murders, which is just so. It's one thing to take a piece of source material and play, right? And you can always play, right? But that one does such violence to the underlying nature of some of the characters in the original text that it's like, well, you could have just written your own, right? <laughs> like, why would you do that kind of thing? So I love, I love when people play in ways that take, uh, take an idea out of the intrinsically xenophobic, racist, sexist, otherwise unacceptable, and no, not okay for their time just because of context. No, they were terrible then, and they're terrible now, and I'm glad that, and I'm glad that sometimes we can take some of these core ideas and, and revisit them in ways that play allows us to do something really meaningful to take something out of, a, out of an intrinsically evil context. But on the other hand, I think sometimes people just get so excited about making something outré that they, they just get so far away from the source that there's not, I, I mean, <laughs> Poor Lily Marston. She's not even recu recu recuperated my mind from, right? Because she becomes a, a, a dominatrix for pay in the in the film in the John Malkovich Malkovich film version of ABC Murders, and she's like, really? Like, yeah. Just a bit. And that's fine. I mean, there can be movies about dominatrix for pay. It's, okay. it's just it didn't work in that story. Mm -hmm. Nothing else. I know you never know what's going to come out of my mouth. <sighs> I'd like to be a fly on your dinner times. <laughs> <laughs> oh, they're not nearly as interesting as this. Well, sometimes. We've listened to the John Paul story. Yeah. Oh, really? Yeah, we listen to the 11 year old. Or, or we introduce things like, uh, like the team of the graduate school gave us buckyball kids. So we made buckyballs. But. No. So it's mostly we look at the calendar for the next day and go, oh my god, how are we going to get everybody where they need to go? So it's not nearly as interesting as this. Anything else? Are picking up Evan and you're picking up John? Yes. Okay, great. You're going to sign the wall. There, you got it. Castle. This might be a completely out of the world question, but just because of the word and the realm of detective and detective genre. Because I'm a huge. And this might be going, uh, this is going to realm of a little bit of supernatural and non-realistic fictional realm, but when it comes to rap novels with, with 
to go here for Batman. I mean, it is claimed to be the greatest detective in the uh, world by the fans, and they'll go on home, hold their form to it, and he also has his own Batman as the greatest detective in the world. And yet, he also has his own comic book line that's separate than Batman called Detective, uh, detective, detective Comics. Mm -hmm. Do you think that they are over not using the word or using the character of the detective? I think it's fine. I think the I think the idea of Playfair puzzle-based detective fiction as being exceedingly narrowly construed according to the 20 rules, the 10 rules, the whatever, I think it's interesting to play with that as a very constrained genre. But I also think there are so many ways globally that people have approached, like if you go back and read the Judge D mysteries, for example, like the right? It, it's just a very different take on what detection is. Um, personally, I've always claimed that Batman is just actually the world's best engineer, but whatever. Um, <laughs> at least one of the most famous ones, but um, but yeah, no, I, I think that, that if you if you come outside of the very intentionally constrained box that I built here and then put us inside of, and you think globally and you think historically that the act of detection or the role of being a detective actually is incredibly, incredibly broad and needs to be wide open and we need to be super, super open to think of all kinds of ways that people make sense of the world. Again, so this is why, right, this always comes back to information science, right? Every time I turn around, I'm like, oh, that's another paper I could write about thinking about how information science and detection connect. And it amazes me when, you know, when I first started doing this work five years ago, and I said, well, you know, detection is intrinsically an information behavior. Let's think about how we can explore detection as an information behavior using theories of information behavior that people were like, what? Nobody's ever done that. And um, I was surprised um, that that was the case. But I think we need to be super, super broad in understanding how it works. All right. Anything else? Anything else? Anything else? Anything I was I always joke at when I teach from eight to ten at nine forty five, I'm always like, okay, I'm pretty sure that given how fast I talk, I have already gotten out as much content as anybody else would have gotten out in the full two hours. So we're probably pretty number of yeah. words wise, we're <laughs> we've probably exhausted our time together and I'm sure that since it's nine hundred degrees in here, um, even I am not cold for once. But you all are probably are they are you ready to let them go? If they're ready to go. Thank you so much. Thank you.